everyone settled? Yes. The next item of business is a debate on motion 17000 in the name of Patrick Harvey on a Green New Deal for Scotland. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Patrick Harvey to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very happy to do so. The concept of a, a Green New Deal is one that has gained more uh, recognition and debate around the world in recent months, uh, particularly with the, the work of uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the US, uh, sparking wider discussion both within and beyond the, the Democratic Party uh, in the USA. But it didn't begin, this concept of a Green New Deal didn't begin there. Uh, in fact, the, the New Economics Foundation, as far back as 2008, uh, put together the, the Green New Deal group, uh, including my own colleague Caroline Lucas, as well as uh, respected individuals like Anne Pettifer and, and many others. Uh, and their report was a response to the financial crash at that time, far, far more than just a green job strategy, an economic agenda, which included re-regulation of finance, addressing issues around debt and stimulus, corporate tax avoidance, and a heavy emphasis on human well-being and quality employment. That work has informed our own in the Scottish Green Party, from uh, our Jobs in the New Economy report to discussion papers produced by the Green Yes campaign on issues such as the necessity for a post-oil future for Scotland's energy system. I'd like to thank the many people who took part in our roundtable event yesterday here in Parliament, uh, not just MSPs from uh, a number of different political parties, uh, but also campaigners, researchers, uh, and those from the, the public and private sectors as well. And it was clear from that discussion that there is an appetite for an ambitious approach to applying the Green New Deal agenda in Scotland. One of our uh, NGO guests said, we clearly need a new approach, an approach that has to be accompanied by a massive acceleration to see the scale of change we need across every sector. Uh, one of the uh, renewable industry representatives said, we, we need something that can build investor confidence and also leverage investment. We need to know the policies supporting renewables will be there decades down the line. Uh, and another said, the industry is only capable of making evolutionary steps. Radical steps won't be taken by industry. And that comment was echoed by a range of people around the room who recognized the, the need for an emphasis for the role of government, uh, including institutions like the Scottish National Investment Bank, because markets and competition alone won't achieve the transformation that's needed. The, the Green New Deal is uh, not a single list of prescriptive policies. It, it comes under a set of key principles, creating the conditions for private investment, yes, but also mobilizing the power of the state through regulation, fiscal and monetary powers, uh, and public and community ownership to address the ecological and social crises that we face in a coherent way and building an economy that's fair, sustainable, and fit for the 21st century. Taken together with the concept of a just transition, I think this offers a clear platform, not only to achieve the radical and rapid economic transformation that's needed, but to ensure that it works for everybody. Now, this concept will apply differently in different contexts. The, uh, the situations in, in the US, the UK, and Scotland are different. Uh, existing programs like universal health care, uh, which that, that many in the, the Democrats are arguing for as part of a US Green New Deal are already in place here. The federal and state relationships in the US are different from the, the relationships between Scotland, the UK, and the EU, the balance of regulatory powers in the different jurisdictions. In Scotland, we would need to act within uh, our current limits, as well as seeking to overcome those limits, uh, as we discussed earlier this afternoon but we also have a high level of public support for climate action and for social justice, and we have an abundant renewable resource. Those are conditions that should allow us to act. I want to look at the amendments that have been brought forward for our, our motion. I, I have to acknowledge that there are merits to the Scottish Government uh, amendment in part, but in other parts, it does 
clearly weaken aspects of our emotion, of our emotion, especially uh, on amendments that we believe are necessary to the Scottish National Investment Bank bill. Given the need for clarity and consistency to achieve long-term investment, how could Parliament have confidence in this agenda remaining central to the bank's objects and missions, except by setting it out clearly on the face of the bill? All ministers sometimes behave as though their own political priorities will persist forever. But ministers and governments do change, and new ones are often tempted to create change for its own sake to make their mark. Now, we are not impressed by the, the Scottish Government's uh, amendment, but if they can give us, in their speeches, a very clear and explicit commitment to the kind of amendments to the Scottish National Investment Bank bill that will put this core purpose onto the face of the legislation uh, to ensure that it can't be removed uh, at the whim of any future government, uh, then we'll, we'll listen to what they have to say. But I do regret that their amendment cuts that principle out of the motion. The Labour's amendment makes some similar arguments about that long-term statutory nature uh, of the decisions we should be making in relation to the Just Transition Commission, placing it on a statutory footing to give it the long-term role that it needs. We'll support that amendment. Although I have to say that the, we, we have a, a concern that we need to not downplay the current value of the uh, jobs in the green economy. I, I recognise that the, uh, the, the report uh, presented to, to the STUC recently has uh, an important contribution to make to the debate, but there are, and it should be acknowledged, even within that report, a recognition that there are more than 46,000 jobs, direct and indirect, already in the low carbon and renewable energy industries in Scotland. There have also been missed opportunities to do more, and I acknowledge that but we should take care not to feed the narrative that is promoted by the anti-wind and climate denial movements. The potential is real uh, if we have the political will to commit to it. Uh, and even more clearly, the alternative to this agenda, business as usual, is simply non-viable. We will obviously oppose the Conservative Amendment, not only for what it deletes, but for their continued attachment to the idea that everlasting economic growth is the way to achieve either a sustainable economy or a fair, a just and equal society. Let's be clear. The right-wing agenda of growth-obsessed free market capitalism is what has brought about the multiple social, ecological and economic crises. The ideas which have brought us to this point cannot be expected to offer the solutions that are necessary to the problems that they've created. Presiding officer, we're in a moment of recognition, I think, of the scale of change that's needed, not just in deploying new greener technologies like renewables, but then the need to reject the idea that our current economy can continue while individuals are told to make different consumer choices. Individual choices matter, but if we make those choices within the context of the economic status quo, with corporations given a free pass to keep extracting and hoarding wealth, and governments prioritizing immediate growth over long-term survival, we will fail. The Greens are not willing to watch that failure, and increasingly the wider public isn't willing to watch that failure either. We put forward the concept of a Green New Deal and encourage all parties to embrace that opportunity positively, and I move the motion in my name. I call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move amendment 17000.3 for up to six minutes. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, and I welcome today's opportunity to debate enhanced mechanisms for the transition to a carbon neutral Scotland. It is important to challenge ourselves, learn from others across the globe, and work together to deliver carbon neutrality. Climate change is a global challenge, and there's a growing international focus on how to meet that challenge. As I've said before many times, Delivering a carbon neutral Scotland may be difficult, but there are also huge opportunities. The Scottish Government recognises the urgency of the call to action on climate change. We are already a recognised world leader in terms of our climate change ambitions, and we do intend to maintain this level of ambition. I welcome that this Chamber has constructively supported the principles of the Climate Change Bill at Stage 1, just before recess. It is important that during today's debate, we recognise that this bill both maintains Scotland's place among those at the forefront of global ambition on climate change and makes target setting more transparent and accountable. The Scottish Government has been absolutely clear that we want to achieve net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases 
as soon as possible and intend to set a target date for this in law as soon as it can be done credibly and responsibly. The 2017 advice available from the Committee on Climate Change proposed the most ambitious statutory emissions reduction targets of any country in the world for 2020, 2030 and 2040. We were happy to take that advice and our legislation was drafted accordingly. It will mean Scotland is carbon neutral by 2050. The world leading nature of the bill targets have been recognised by a number of leading international figures, including Laurent Fabius, architect of the Paris Agreement, who described the bill as a concrete application of the Paris Agreement. However, the special report published by the IPCC last October represents a very significant step forward in the scientific evidence underpinning the Paris Agreement. Responding quickly to the IPCC's report, the Scottish Government joined the Welsh and UK governments in commissioning further independent expert advice on targets from the CCC. And that advice is scheduled to be published on the 2nd of May next Thursday. If the CCC advise next week that higher targets for Scotland are now credible, the Scottish Government, as we have said consistently, will, in line with this advice, amend the bill accordingly at stage two. However, the First Minister was clear at the STUC conference last week that ushering in the carbon neutral age shouldn't just make Scotland a greener nation, but must also make us a healthier, wealthier and fairer nation. We believe that a just transition to carbon neutrality is one that will create jobs through new sustainable industries, is good for communities and helps to tackle inequalities and poverty. The benefits of transitioning to a carbon neutral economy need to be shared widely. We must be mindful not to leave anyone behind, whether they be businesses, industry or domestic consumers. And this focus on a just transition builds on our approach to maximising the opportunities of a low carbon economy. In 2017, uh, as Patrick Harvey has acknowledged, the Scottish low carbon and renewable energy sector supported over 46,000 jobs and generated over £11 billion in turnover. This is significant. And together across this chamber, we have a responsibility to promote what Scotland is achieving. We can always, of course, strive to do better, and this government has long been committed to ensuring that Scotland maximises the economic opportunity of the transition to a carbon neutral economy. We need to work together to plan for and invest in socially and environmentally sustainable jobs, sectors and economies. And this government has never said that we hold all the answers to this. We've been open to advice, sought the opinion of others and looked widely at best practice. That resulted in the establishment of the Just Transition Commission. We were the first country anywhere to do this. The Commission brings together 11 independent members and is chaired by Professor Jim Ski. The remit is to advise on continuing the transition in a way that promotes social cohesion and equality. Work started in January and independent advice on the opportunities and challenges of moving to a carbon neutral economy will be provided within two years. And I hope that the Chamber will support the proposal of a Scottish Green New Deal to secure the economic and social benefits for everyone of delivering our climate change targets. The early core principles of the Green New Deal job creation linked with decarbonisation, tackling inequality within communities and ensuring access to finance to accelerate the transition are not new. In fact, they are consistent with many of this government's policies and our programme. I look forward to hearing views from across the chamber on these areas today. We are listening and if we need to reshape or refocus existing activity to maximise the benefits for Scotland, then we will. However, of particular interest to me is the views of members on the additional regulatory, fiscal and monetary powers that the Scottish Government would need to implement such a new deal fully. As our amendment recognises, the main fiscal and monetary policy levers to support action in this area remain reserved to the UK Government. I've made many calls on the UK Government to increase its ambition to tackle climate change and to better align with the level of ambition in Scotland. Whilst regulatory levers remain reserved, we need the UK Government to do their bit in order for Scotland to achieve net zero emissions as soon as possible. It is hard, therefore, not to refer you back to the content closing. of the First Minister's earlier statement. This reiterated our commitment to pursuing 
uh, Scottish independence. We need to have all the necessary tools and levers at the disposal of this parliament to deliver for Scotland. That will allow us to work together to promote Scotland's success, the skills of its people and the level of ambition in this area. In conclusion, I move the amendment put forward in my name. And I call on Maurice Golden to speak to and move amendment 1700.1. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We agree with much of the sentiment in the Green motion, but we will not be able to support the text of his motion in its entirety. And indeed, having heard uh, from Patrick Harvey the articulation which he gave of extreme socialism is no way in which to tackle climate change. And nevertheless, whether you call it a, a Green New Deal, the circular economy, or anything else, successfully tackling the breakdown of our climate can only be achieved by building a more sustainable economy. Business as usual is not an option. Therefore, the Scottish Conservatives stand ready to work with any proposals in this area that will take, and we will take an evidence-based approach with regard to our support. The public appetite for such change is growing, and this parliament is at its best when it works together in order to deliver that, putting the needs of our planet and our next generation ahead of party politics. We have already seen that on individual policies. For example, Scottish Conservatives and Green MSPs alike called for a moratorium on new incineration capacity here in Scotland. Or, for example, when the Scottish Conservatives led cross-party support to bring forward energy efficiency targets to tackle fuel poverty. However, cooperation can be difficult when some still indulge in making unrealistic promises or peddling utopian fantasies. Consider the SNP's claim that renewables would create 20,000 jobs only for those jobs not to materialise here in Scotland. False dawns erode the public trust we need to transition away from some of these older industries. Yet the Greens are now promising 10 times as many from a rapid low carbon transition. With livelihoods at stake, many in the North East in particular, but indeed across Scotland, will be sceptical of such claims and will wonder how these fanciful scenarios will work in the real world. Yes. John Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention on that point. What does the member have to say about those who worked in the solar industry who overnight saw uh, the UK government's policy erode that industry? Maurice Colton. Well, uh, temporary market interventions are, are, are to be welcomed, but ultimately renewables and the business case for any intervention in climate change must stack up. And I would urge the member to think about the economic realities of today and using the business case that we have uh, to make the case for the circular economy. But I appreciate that is something that is often lost on the Green Party. Uh, and that can be seen in their actions in consecutive bu budgets. Each time uh, the Greens could have pressed for transformational environmental policies uh, in order to back the SNP, but instead all we got was a tax on people driving to work. But I do welcome the ambition of both the UK and the Scottish governments. Uh, the UK government is a world leader in tackling climate change and transitioning to a sustainable economy. Greenhouse gas emissions are down a quarter from 2010 while the share of our electricity needs from renewables is up from just under 6% in 2009 to a third now. That has been brought about by a £52 billion investment that did not just promise low carbon jobs, but delivered 400,000 of them. Scotland has also made progress too, thanks to public and private sector action. We lead the UK in emissions reductions with a drop of almost a half and our renewable electricity share is over two thirds. However, the Scottish Conservatives are determined to continue pushing for practical evidence-based policies so that real change can actually be delivered. For example, urban consolidation hubs and switching public procurement to electric vehicles where possible by 2027. 
which would help to tackle transport emissions, reduce air pollution and promote positive economic and health outcomes. Projects such as an electric arc furnace, new plastic uh, recycling plant would also help to deliver the low carbon jobs that we need while boosting recycling. But underpinning all of this is the circular economy. We would embed He's it just across all government departments to ensure protecting the environment, reducing waste and creating opportunities for all was at the heart of Scottish uh, government policies. This is the Green New Deal that Scotland needs. Could you formally move your amendment? Uh, and I move the amendment in my name. <laughs> Thank you. I now call Richard Leonard to speak to and move amendment 17000.2. Five minutes, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, Scottish Labour welcomes this debate. We want to reinstate full employment as a goal of public policy. We want to see real economic change. We want to see a new kind of society, a caring society, where the whole economy is a social economy and every job is a green job. So, of course, it's important that this debate starts with renewable energy jobs. But we must recognise that there is a need for a Green New Deal right across all sectors of the economy. And I say in all sincerity that we will not attain the transformative change we need by leaving it up to market forces or merely leaving it to the mitigation of market forces through defensive action. To anyone who doubts that, go and look at the powerful oral evidence submitted to this Parliament's Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee just yesterday morning. Go and read the hard-hitting report, broken promises and offshore jobs <coughs> presented to the Scottish Trade Union Congress in Dundee just last week. Or go and ask the workers at Bifab in Methyl, Burnt Island and Arnish Point. The introduction to the new STUC report is absolutely clear, so let me quote it. The STUC is absolutely committed to building a low carbon economy and meeting climate change targets. However, we are criticising the failure of industrial policy. I would go further. We're not just criticising the failure of industrial policy. We are criticising the Scottish Government's failure to have an industrial policy in the first place. So when I addressed the STUC Congress last week, as the leader of the Scottish Labour Party, I called for trade union involvement in not just sectoral collective bargaining, but in sectoral economic and industrial planning, because we need to transform our institutions. If we are to repurpose not just the Michelin in Dundee or the Cali Works in Glasgow, if we are to repurpose the whole Scottish economy, it cannot be done according to the central tenets of neoliberal economics. The old ideas of privatisation, of austerity, of rolling back the sta state, it cannot be done either through a continued over-reliance on imported goods and services or foreign direct investment on multinational financial and corporate interests. Instead, what we need is an innovative state. That means using the powers the Scottish Government has got in procurement, in planning, in licensing, in investment to ensure that low carbon and renewable energy developments bring far greater economic benefit to communities across Scotland. And it means establishing a properly capitalised national investment bank to secure by public investment the economic rebalancing that we need and the building up of our manufacturing base that must go with it. It means as well investing in new forms of common ownership, of cooperative ownership, municipal ownership and public ownership. Presiding officer, there is a growing restlessness out there. School pupils striking, young people, some with no vote, no vote, but who have voices, voices that need to be heard and listened to. And across all generations, there is a rising determination which this parliament needs to better reflect on the need for a new urgency of action, for a renewed vitality on the need for change. I am optimistic that we can make the leap, the transformative change that we need to make with a planned transition, a democratic transition, a just transition. 
so that the very economic foundations of society become much more democratic, much more accountable and much more sustainable. Because the struggle we face to save the planet and to halt climate change is in the end a struggle for social, economic and environmental justice. And it's a struggle that not only can be won, it's a struggle that must be won. I move the amendment in my name. I now call Bully Rennie for up to four minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I can agree with much of what has been said this afternoon. Uh, building a fair and sustainable economy requires change, and that change must be fair and just. It must not mean greater concentrations of wealth, but a fairer distribution. That means jobs and opportunities for local communities that often feel left behind, and it requires investment regulation and incentives by government. But recent evidence is not encouraging. I wish this were not the case. But there is real anger in Fife about BIFAB. Keith Brown, when he was the economy minister, said the takeover of BIFAB by DF Barnes was a very good day for employees and assured Parliament that the firm had no intention of shedding further staff. Just 21 days later, many of those same employees lost their jobs. Weeks later, the company failed to win contracts for the fabrication of turbine jackets and floating platforms for the Murray East and Kincardine projects. Gary Smith from the GMB has spoken much sense on this. He has captured the sense of betrayal in local communities. To the working class communities in Burn Island and Methil, he said, this doesn't look like a just transition or a green jobs revolution. Now, when mainstream renewable power were lobbying for the Nat Nagoch wind farm in the outer fourth estuary, they said they would create hundreds of jobs during construction and operation will generate significant local economic impact across the country, in particular on the east coast from Dundee to Eyemouth. They specifically lobbied for the support of working class communities on the basis that they would see a return for these communities in terms of jobs. And the former First Minister, Alex Salmond, promised that Scotland would be a Saudi Arabia of renewables manufacturing. Well, now is the crunch time for the Scottish Government to deliver on those promises to the BIFAB workers and the workers across the country to make sure we do have that just transition. I support renewables. Our record on renewables is strong. But we need to make sure we take everyone with us. And that means making sure that those communities in Fife that I have talked on get a return for that investment as well. They've got an interest in the long-term survivability and sustainability of our planet. But they need, they need those jobs right now too. Today's debate enshrines the importance of building a fairer and more equal society while transitioning away from carbon dependent industries. Liberal Democrats have consistently forced the pace in countering climate change threats. In government, we've got a very proud record from nearly tripling electricity from renewables to making more than one million homes warmer and cheaper to heat and securing an ambitious EU-wide agreement on tackling climate change. We delivered in the face of almost daily battles with the Conservative Party in government. And today we oppose the opening of a new front in carbon-based fuels with fracking, just like we oppose the Scottish Government's proposed subsidy for the open cast coal industry. And we oppose the SNP plans to slash air passenger duty too. And we are urging the Scottish Government to get a grip of its waste strategy, which only yesterday was heavily criticised by a report that highlighted the problem with a million tonnes of waste. How on earth can it be meeting our environmental obligations to send Scotland's waste to England for landfill? It shows that speeches in this chamber are insufficient to tackle climate change. It is actions that count. Thank you very much. And I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's very clear that we're now standing at the crossroads in the climate emergency. 
And there is an ambitious path we can take with vision, courage, dynamism, and a commitment that we leave no one behind in the transition that is necessary. We can start the journey by setting the net zero target in our climate bill, sending the strongest signal to everyone from the climate striker to the banker that Scotland's mission is to meet the climate emergency head on. As Greta Thunberg said to MPs yesterday, sometimes we just simply have to find a way. The moment we decide to fulfill something, we can do anything. But it's also what industry voices are demanding too. Aviva have said that a net zero target would give us the confidence we need to scale up investments and help deliver a zero carbon economy. So the Scottish Government needs a clear vision, mission and confidence to tackle the climate crisis, even though the solutions cannot be mapped out with certainty by either the UK Climate Change Committee or this Parliament. It's a change in mindset that is needed across the whole of government in tackling this challenge. Setting the net zero target is the first step, but a Green New Deal is essential to enable the industries to make the big transformative leaps into doing things differently and better. The economist Keynes said that it is not the role of government to do things which individuals are doing already, but to do those things which at present are not done at all. And there lies the strongest tool in the box that we have to drive transformation and transition. The state has provided the foundation for our biggest breakthroughs. The technology behind the internet, the iPhone, pharmaceuticals have all come from a confident risk-taking state, investing in innovation to not just fix markets, but to help create entirely new ones. Leading industry voices came together in Parliament to discuss a Green New Deal yesterday. They have a thirst to deliver the change, but what they cannot do alone is develop the solutions to the climate crisis when, when they are at their most risky stage of development. And this is where the Scottish Government must up its game, starting with a stronger national investment bank, with a clearer statutory purpose, alongside a bolder public energy company set up to share directly in the financial rewards of progress. Simply hoping that the free market will find a path on its own when fossil fuel corporates are investing over $200 million every year in climate change lobbying is naive at best. Government needs to lead the mission with an energy policy that is not based on simply more of everything. If the Scottish Government funds an oil and gas technology center, then its mission can only be decommissioning and transition, not gunning for every single last drop to be extracted by 2040. One tragedy of the BIFAB situation mentioned already by Willie Rennie is that the state did not take a direct stake earlier in the offshore wind supply chain. Instead, we have yards at Methyl that have sat waiting for much needed private investment that never came, affecting the, the competitiveness of the company. Government must take the lead in growing markets where we have an advantage such as wave, wave and tidal technology while championing new low carbon opportunities that aren't even off the drawing board yet. We can draw inspiration from history and from great doers like Tom Johnston, who wielded the transformative power of the state to deliver our first great renewables revolution. And at the same time, we can assure that no worker, from the oil and gas engineer to the farmer, is left behind. Presiding officer, our chances of walking out of this crisis get slimmer every day. The alarm bells rung a long time ago. It's time to get up and run. It's time for a Green New Deal for Scotland that tackles the climate emergency, creates hundreds and thousands of jobs across Scotland, and makes Scotland a fairer, more equitable nation. Thank you. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by John Scott. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, President Officer, I welcome this debate and, uh, and I thank the Greens for bringing it to the Chamber this afternoon. Uh, the Greens and my party share a, a number of uh, common goals as well as also some differences. Uh, but uh, certainly one of the common goals is that, uh, that there certainly shouldn't be a glass ceiling uh, placed upon Scotland and that the issue of independence is certainly the way forward to deliver a better Scotland, something that Patrick Harvey touched upon in, in his comments earlier on, as well as the, the statement from the First Minister uh, earlier on this afternoon. But some in this Parliament don't agree with that position, and that's legitimate uh, from their particular perspective. However, 
If the Scottish Government uh, develop the Green New Deal proposals, which require either support from the UK Government to actually help deliver the proposals, or which require the devolution of powers to deliver these proposals, will the Scottish Tories actually support these efforts in principle? Now, Maurice Golden, in his comments earlier on, uh, spoke about that we will look at any proposals. So if that is the case, then I will welcome, and I do welcome, the Tories actually supporting the Scottish Government in this regard. But uh, I mean, it genuinely, I've got another genuine question, actually, a genuine question uh, to the Tories as well, is that we can all agree that we actually want to see a cleaner and greener Scotland, actually helping deliver our carbon neutral economy. But the Tories amendment mentions the issue of a circular economic strategy. Now, clearly, uh, we could actually, we could have been further down that line, progressing down that line along the journey of uh, carbon capture and storage if the UK government hadn't cancelled the CCS competition in 2015. Okay. Uh, I thank the member for uh, taking an intervention. Rather than uh, uh, blaming Westminster for one particular aspect, does the member accept that the SNP government uh, household recycling targets which will not be met met for 12 years after the deadline was set is a real indictment on this SNP government Stuart what I what I what I do accept uh, Mr Gordon is the fact that this parliament doesn't actually have the full range of powers to deal with many of the issues that Scotland actually has to address. I also actually want to touch upon something else that Mr Gordon commented on. I, was, I wonder how the Tories explain nuclear waste in the circular economy uh, are, uh, regarding the environment as well as the economy. I mean, storing the waste is not something that I'm sure that uh, the vast majority of the population see as a positive product. I'm not, I'm not sure if the Tories recognise that the, the circular economy is actually one of the headline themes of Scotland's manufacturing action plan. It sits alongside skills, innovation, and all of the, the other things that you'd expect to find in a manufacturing plan. Now, presenting our citizens, the Cabinet Secretary highlighted uh, in, uh, in her earlier comments that the Scottish uh, low carbon and uh, renewable energy sector support, supported over 46,000 jobs and generated over £11 billion in turnover in 2017. Now, and the Just Transition Commission uh, has also been established to provide ministers with uh, practical advice uh, on promoting a fair, inclusive jobs market uh, as we move to a, a carbon neutral economy. And on the face of it, Labour's amendment uh, regarding the statutory footing of the Just Transition Committee it sounds reasonable. However, surely they will agree that the, the best course of action is to actually wait for the Commission to report uh, back and, uh, and base the decisions on what's needed for subsequent years. Now, I'm sure that they will also agree, so I, 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 I'm just about to finish it, I'm sure they'll also agree that the, the landscape might have changed and might be different in two years' time as compared to, as compared to now, this, that the Commission might not be the most appropriate body for that work uh, that's actually required by then. Presenting also the Just Transition Commission is an important addition uh, to working to deliver a carbon neutral economy and I welcome a constructive dialogue being a central pillar uh, to its approach. I'm also conscious of the time, so I'll conclude by saying, saying also, I do want the Scottish Government to develop a Green New Deal policy which promotes an inclusive and sustainable economy that prioritises decarbonisation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. John Scott to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and as a food producer? And while I agree with much of the sentiment of what has been said today, I would perhaps take a less radical and more cautious approach than the Greens and build on what we have, always bearing in mind that Scotland has responsibility for only 0.1% or one thousandth of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. However, what we can do is offer leadership as well as play our full part, but note that every option costs money. And the financial memorandum from the Climate Change Bill currently before Parliament guesstimates that a net zero target by 2050 will cost £13 billion. So who will pay for the transformational change that's likely to be required to take us to a low carbon economy? Much is made of the opportunities for innovation about the potential to create hundreds of thousands of new jobs by WWF and others, and it's certainly an objective I would like to see fulfilled, but I just don't think it's going to happen. I'm afraid I've really pushed for time, Patrick, I'm really sorry. Uh, look at our onshore and offshore wind development, our most successful low carbon industry, which so far has only provided less than 10,000 jobs in Scotland. 
So to develop completely new industries not yet thought of that are going to deliver a jobs bonanza of almost 200,000 people, while a laudable aim is not one yet supported by the facts or experience of Scotland's track record as far as I can see. So if innovative and start-up companies are unable or unlikely to provide, with the best will in the world, to provide the investment to create or sustain tens of thousands of new jobs, the knee-jerk reaction here in Scotland has always been to look to government to do so. But, presiding officer, based on the track record of the last 14 years, the Scottish Government has neither the money or the ability to develop new industries that will, at the same time, create tens of thousands of jobs and produce worldwide reduction in greenhouse gases. Put simply, Scottish Government capital investment monies are, and will be, and should be, used to build new hospitals, new schools, new roads, railways and housing, etc. And Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay never tires of telling us that there's not enough money to do that. So, the question remains, who's going to finance necessary infrastructure changes? And the answer is those with the research and investment budgets, namely current fossil fuel energy providers, for one, as they transition to providing energy in a low carbon way, and Scottish Power is a shining example of what I mean. Similarly, for transport, existing train, bus and car manufacturers will, in reality, be the deliverers of real change. Yep. As Simon French cogently argued in the Times on Saturday, it will fall to private sector groups to build the infrastructure necessary for a low-carbon economy, to which we all aspire today. The same will be true for agriculture, and it will be landowners and land managers and farmers who will have to provide the capital supported by a more holistic appraisal of what agricultural land delivers to create a low-carbon rural economy. Maurice Golden's amendment helpfully points us in the direction of a circular economy, again building on what we have and those who are already doing the business continuing to do so in a low-carbon way. So, presiding officer, it will be for the government to declare its level of ambition following advice from the Climate Change Committee to responsibly set achievable targets which will in large part be delivered by the private sector. Of course local authorities and health boards and other agencies of government will have a part to play, but the big shift in innovation to a low carbon infrastructure in energy provision, to a low carbon agriculture, to low carbon transport will come from the private sector and we must encourage the private sector to do all they can by creating a fiscal climate here in Scotland that encourages them to deliver the better future that we all seek. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Fulton McGregor. McGregor. Thank you very much. The motion before us today refers to our rapid and just transition. And as Richard Leonard said, most of us will sign up to that. The challenge is how to strike the right balance between speed and fairness in that transition. Getting that balance right is vital for many sectors of our economy and for the jobs and livelihoods of those who work in them. It is particularly important that we get the balance right from the point of view of our energy industries and energy workers. North East Scotland has one of the largest concentrations of energy expertise anywhere in Europe. Aberdeen, the oil capital of Europe for the last 40 years, aspires to be the energy capital of Europe for the next 40 years and beyond. How to make a just transition is therefore not an abstract issue. It is a matter of vital and personal interest to tens of thousands of people in the area I represent, and indeed across Scotland. Mark Roscoe. Giving way, would you, would you not acknowledge then that it's important that if you're going to set up an oil and gas technology centre, that that becomes an all energy technology centre that actually addresses the needs for emerging technologies, including renewables? Louis McDonald. I have the right to make that point, and that is what the oil and gas technology centre is, as I'm sure when he visits it, he will find out that they're doing very many, very good, uh, uh, innovative things in renewable energy offshore. And I'm glad he mentioned it because it's not on my list, but it is a critical area of energy transition. But other big steps have already been taken. Aberdeen has the largest fleet of hydrogen buses in Europe. The world's largest wind turbines generate power in Aberdeen Bay. 
the largest domestic district heating scheme in Britain, has cut both carbon emissions and fuel poverty for thousands of council tenants, and Aberdeen Renewable Energy Group provides an outstanding model of municipal leadership in working towards a low carbon economy. Indeed, Aberdeen Bay is only one of a large and growing number of wind farms in the northeast, onshore and offshore, while the Aiken pro project at St Fergus has the potential to lead Britain and Europe in enabling carbon capture and storage in the North Sea. Now, those many projects are not crowded into the North East just because we have innovative universities, enterprising councils, and a world-class workforce, although all those things are true. Those projects are here because we have energy industries and energy workers who have been delivering for a generation, working in some of the toughest environments in the world and developing successive new technologies to overcome technical challenges which would once have been seen as insurmountable. Public policy and expectation now look to our energy industries and energy workers to make different things happen. Those industries and workers are already adapting, seeking to deliver both low carbon energy and su successful carbon sequestration in those same challenging offshore environments. The choice we have to make now is whether to seek to deliver energy transition through partnership with the energy sector and energy workers or in opposition to existing energy businesses and those who work there. We should choose to develop a strategy to deliver real change, not simply to virtue signal at the expense of the people who work in our energy industry. Labour is clear that we want real change and we want to deliver it in partnership with workers in energy. We need to see real action by Scottish and UK government ministers to secure real jobs in the renewable energy sector as an essential precondition of a just transition for our existing energy workforce. Many oil and gas workers are fully engaged with this debate. They are clear that energy transition must start with the creation of high quality, high skilled new energy jobs, not with getting rid of those we already have. A generation ago, Scotland failed to capture the economic benefits of onshore wind, despite having led the way in developing the technology. We must not let that happen again. Government must find new ways to secure those future energy jobs, and it must do so in partnership with our people who work in the energy industry. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by our closing speeches. Claude Beamish. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. And I'd also like to thank the, the Green Party for bringing this very important debate to the Chamber. The, the term a Green New Deal is something that we're hearing a lot across, uh, right across the world, and more than ever, we're seeing the mobilisation from not just pressure groups as it, as it once was, but citizens and businesses as a whole uh, towards a carbon neutral economy. Indeed, we're seeing our, our young people uh, leading the way by striking as part of the school strike for climate movement, where pupils uh, chose to take part in demonstrations to demand action to prevent future and further global warming and climate change. And I must commend, as others have, the Swedish environmental activist Greta Thunberg, who at just 16 years old is showing not just our fellow young people, but everyone who activism and taking a stand can make a difference regardless of age or background. But of course, as well as um, putting on record uh, my appreciation of Greta, I want to also thank the many young people uh, in my own constituency of Coatbridge and Chryston who have contacted me uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks about this very issue, and indeed the, the, the couple of folk who have actually emailed me today uh, while this speech has been going on. I'd like to thank them for all the work that they are doing. Um, we are facing not just a country, but as a planet, the potential for a state of environmental emergency. There's, there's really not much dispute about that. The time to make meaningful action is passing us by, but we also must make sure measures are in place so that we are fully prepared for the economic challenges that come along with the transitioning to a greener and healthier Scotland. And there is no reason why we can't be both green and prosperous. After all, the low carbon and renewable emer emergency sector generated over 11 billion in 2017. And Scotland's natural environment is almost perfect uh, in some ways for us to become green. And it's no surprise it's worth 20 billion a year to our economy with 60,000 direct jobs. Rural Scotland covers 98% of Scotland's landmass and three of Scotland's key, gr key growth sectors, food and drink, energy and tourism, are reliant on Scotland's natural resources. Therefore, we must ensure that there are protective measures in place and that our rural economy is safeguarded. And I think that there is also a general consensus that Brexit is one of the main threats to that just now. It's also known that our industrial sector accounts for 
over half of our exports and sustains a significant number of high value jobs across Scotland. That's why I agree with the, the comments made by the Cabinet Secretary earlier. We cannot make the transition to a low carbon future without ensuring that domestic industry continues to thrive. And rather than meet targets through diminishing the industrial base across Scotland and putting forward the risk of industries relocating to areas where climate regulation is less stringent. And I'm sure that Richard Leonard and members of the Labour Party agree with me that we won't want to be putting uh, workers in our working population in any sort of difficulty and any sort of disadvantage. And that's why the, 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 I believe that the, the, the Just Transition and the, the Just Transition um, Commission, which will report back in two years, is a very, very important factor in this in moving towards a, a carbon neutral economy. And we must look at all the different aspects of that, increasing uh, active travel, for example, the new jobs uh, in the sector that others have mentioned. But, President Officer, I'd also like to, to take the opportunity to urge local authorities to take action. And I'm glad to see that carbon management plans are being, are being followed across the country. North Lancashire Council Local Authority for uh, my constituency have come to the end of their current plan and are currently proposing their new plan to committee within the next few weeks. And I've been assured uh, just, just as recently as today that that substantial measures have been put in place and funding for pilot projects to work towards lower carbon are being sought. And I would urge the local councillors that will back that committee to ensure that this plan is rigid and guarantees that the new three-year plan is substantial to ensure that we see real change by 2022. But while I'm also putting that challenge down to North Lanarkshire Council, I also want to, to put on record my thanks to them for their, their, their strong support um, for the local community in Coatbridge against uh, an incinerator which has been going on for 11 years. So they have responded uh, to environmental concerns in the past and I hope that will continue. And I will leave it there, President Officer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr McGregor. And we move to closing speeches. Claudia Beamish to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Scottish Green Party bringing this motion for debate today. And Scottish Labour will support the motion in Patrick Harvey's name. A Green New Deal could be the way to root our climate ambitions in systematic economic transformation for the public good with the right criteria. It is, however, worth reflecting at this stage in the debate on the opportunities in the low carbon and renewable uh, economy that have slipped away from Scotland due to poor planning and failure to support Scottish industry. The STUC report is right to lament, and I quote, what could have been as we see European neighbours reaping the, those benefits and contracts literally slipping through our fingers. Scottish Renewables has also spoken of the historic underinvestment in UK yards compared to Europe, but caveat this by saying there are certainly things that can be done and issues are fixable. A new Green Deal could certainly be the way to focus attention on these issues across all sectors, pulling together the just transition the Scottish National Investment Bank and industrial strategy, new forms of ownership and our climate targets. The Just Transition Commission must be at the very core of the, new green, of, the, of the Green New Deal. Yes, we need investment and we need strategy, but equity must remain the final test. That will be the role of a commission and Scottish Labour is adamant that it must be written in statute in the Climate Change Bill. It will be long term, it must be independent of government and it must be well resourced to fulfill this remit. When the energy industry and its need for a just transition is imper an imperative for Scottish Labour, this support is equally important across a range of other sectors. One such is farming and the land use sector. So many farmers work in isolation, meaning the consequences of climate mitigation and adaptation are less visible and that the more than in the more concentrated energy workers and communities. This industry also needs forward planning in policy accompanied by commission advice, support and skills training. And if this support for change is affected across all sectors, we will continue to discover new areas for improvement and that can bring, bring innovation and jobs. Textiles is one such area, currently wasting 65,000 tonnes to landfill every year. A new circular economy approach would also help tackle clothing poverty. The Labour Amendment today calls for the Green New Deal to support alternative forms of ownership in the public interest. We, we know of um, the offshore wind industry in my colleague Lewis um, uh, McDonald's constituency and region, and there, there are Scandinavian and other 
um, models where publicly owned offshore wind operates. If the Scandinavians can do it, so can we here in Scotland, and we must support this. There are also other forms of, um, uh, of energy gaining in the public interest. Smaller scale, the Edinburgh Solar Cooperative is climate friendly and the surplus can be, surplus can be reinvested in the social good. Municipalities worldwide are forging their own path. As Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York City says, one of the best steps national governments can take is to fight climate change, to fight climate change is to empower their cities with the tools and autonomy they need to act. And Aberdeen Renewable Energy Group has taken a lead on this, as have others across Scotland and the UK. And community ownership. In Lewis, the Galston estate has three 900 kilowatt wind turbines, the net profit from which is distributed to the community via the Galston Trust Community Investment Fund. And it has proved that there can be support to community and social events and the total of other funds leveraged in to support these initiatives as a result amounts to 2.3 million pounds. Scotland can create stable jobs, strengthen communities, wipe out fuel poverty, do its bit to stem climate change and relocalize economies. As Richard Leonard says, we need an innovative state and the new Green Deal supported by the Just Transition Commission must get this right for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. I call Dean Lockhart to be followed by Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I uh, begin by referring to my register of interest in connection with a smart meter business in England. This debate deals with one of the most pressing and critical challenges facing this generation and future ones, how to address climate change by transitioning to a carbon neutral economy and society. Our amendment to the Green Motion today highlights the increasing recognition in Scotland and across the world that future economic growth must be aligned with environmental protection and tackling climate change. As other members have said, business as usual is no longer viable. Here in Scotland, while significant, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Wyman, I, I've only got four minutes. I, I've got quite a lot to cover. Uh, here in Scotland, we have made significant progress. Emissions are down 49% in the last 30 years, but progress has been mixed over sectors and more robust action is required to deliver the transition. Whether we call this uh, transition delivery mechanism a new green deal or otherwise, the transition to a carbon neutral economy will require a whole of government approach. Yeah. It will require investments of unprecedented scale, a fundamental review of the skills and training necessary for the future workforce, a balance between energy security and energy costs, and that transition must be delivered in a structured, coordinated and just manner so that no one is left behind. The reality is, uh, Presiding Officer, there are already in place a number of delivery mechanisms that can help achieve these outcomes. The UK government's industrial strategy has made clean growth a central part of its sustainable economic policy. It provides the massive scale of investment required to support the transition, with £37 billion of investment available to promote sustainable economic growth. This includes £2.5 billion to invest in low-carbon innovation, the announcement of a new offshore wind sector deal, plans to make the UK the global leader for green finance to support clean, uh, uh, clean growth, and as a result, the low carbon economy in the UK is expected to grow by 11% each year in the next decade. And we want Scotland to benefit from this low carbon growth. And that's why we repeatedly call on the Scottish Government to work closely with the UK Government to make sure that Scottish business uh, can capitalise on those low carbon opportunities. The Scottish Government itself can progress the transition by introducing a dedicated circular economy strategy for Scotland. Morris Golden, in his opening remarks, referred to an ambitious programme that could create 40,000 jobs if the Scottish Government were to embed this in all portfolio areas. This would include the creation of new institutions like uh, the Institute of uh, Reuse, microplastic recycling facilities and promote the best practice as across Scotland. So we would encourage the Scottish go uh, Government to follow our policy recommendations in this area. Another d d uh, delivery mechanism other members have spoken about is the Scottish National Investment Bank and we agree in principle that should be focused on the transition but all of the projects must be evidence-based 
to ensure that projects are viable and sustainable. We cannot repeat the mistakes of the recent past where uh, £40 million of taxpayers' money was lost on failed investments such as Palamas and Aqua Marine. That cannot be the focus of the bank going forward. Finally, the Scottish Government's own climate change plans must also play an important part in the transition. However, these plans will need to address the concerns raised by witnesses in the Economy Committee who raise concerns that the plans can't simply be wishful thinking, but they must be backed up by credible, uh, credible policies, resources and more specific targets. Presiding officer, all of these pol pol policy platforms can help achieve the outcome of a carbon neutral Scotland. But policy in this area will have to be prioritised. It will have to be implemented through a whole of government approach. Unfortunately, as we heard earlier today from the First Minister, the priorities of this Scottish Government are focused elsewhere and are not focused on climate change, sustainable economic growth or training the workforce of the future. Well done. I move, I, I support the amendment in Maurice well Golden's done, name. Indeed. Thank you very much. And I call on Ivan McKee to close for the Government. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, today's debate has covered many of the opportunities uh, the transition to a carbon neutral economy offers. And in addition to tackling climate change, Scotland's ambition to drive down emissions can help us achieve social and economic gains, including increasing investment, creating employment and tackling inequality. We want to continue this debate we've had today and the weeks and months ahead, focusing on the challenges and very much on the opportunities this presents to Scotland. And the issues discussed today are not new, and we should acknowledge the significant progress and achievements already made. Scotland has a well-deserved reputation for recognising and tackling climate change and for demonstrating a proactive approach to innovation across the green economy. The Scottish Government has provided significant investment to businesses, communities and the public sector through our suite of low carbon support programmes, which include our low carbon infrastructure transition programme, as well as our community and renewable energy scheme. I've been fortunate enough to uh, visit a number of uh, overseas countries during my time as Minister, including to Ireland, Norway, Denmark and many others. And everywhere I go, Scotland is seen and recognised as a world leader in renewable energy innovation and adoption. Provisional figures show that the equivalent of almost 75% of Scotland's gross electricity consumption was from renewable sources in 2018, an increase from 70% uh, the year earlier, another record year. And over £18.5 million in the last year has been paid in community benefits by the renewable energy sector to local communities across Scotland. This money has been transformational to some communities, allowing them to support a number of social and economic projects. Scotland's already a global leader in floating offshore wind. With High Wind, the world's first floating wind farm off, located off Peterhead. And I just want to comment on Richard Leonard's comment about the evils of FDI. Equinor has put the money in to get the High Wind project up and running. And the value of FDI is something that needs to be included. We're investing not only government money, but also with others who have uh, technology and investment to make, to make Scotland's um, renewables energy sector all it can be. I don't have time for that, un unfortunately. We are committed to maximising the offshore wind sector in Scotland and the Finance Secretary Derek Mackay will co-host an offshore wind summit with UK Energy Minister Claire Perry at the start of May. Decommissioning presents another distinct and clear opportunity for innovation, growth and economic development and the Scottish Government wants to ensure that the infrastructure is in place to allow the world-class Scottish supply chain to continue to develop competitive capabilities. Our work through the Decommissioning Challenge Fund is providing direct support to the supply chain to ready it for the opportunities in decommissioning, creating growth and employment. And the offshore, the oil and gas technology centre, as Mark Ruskell should know, is very much focused additionally on renewables and is a key part of that transition. And I suggest he goes and visit them in Aberdeen to understand what they are, what they're engaged in, as I have uh, myself have done. The circular economy is also a priority. Um, yesterday I visited McReber in Lockerbie and was very impressed with their innovative technology using recycled plastics to manufacture roads, creating the conditions for a successful and powerful circular economy means making it easy for businesses like MacReber to develop and roll out their technology here in Scotland 
and across the world. And I just want to comment on Maurice Golden's uh, um, comments in his, uh, in his uh, opening speech about the number of jobs. Um, he talked about uh, the great number of 400,000 low carbon renewable jobs across the UK and how much a success that was. He'll therefore recognise that the 46,000 low carbon renewable jobs in Scotland, a significantly higher percentage than that across the rest of the UK, is also an achievement of this, uh, this Scottish Government. Turning to the Scottish National Investment Bank, um, the bank has the potential to transform Scotland's economy providing capital for businesses at all stages in their investment life cycle and important infrastructure projects to catalyse private sector investment. The bill for the creation of the bank was introduced in February and will support the establishment of the bank in 2020. The bank will take a mission-based approach to investment with Scottish ministers setting the strategic direction. This approach will help to create and shape future markets, support innovation and tackle socio-economic challenges. As the First Minister said in her speech to the STUC, supporting the transition to carbon neutral society will be a key mission for the bank. This recognises the important role the bank has to play in supporting future low and carbon neutral industries and infrastructure and financing improvements to existing industries. We welcome the consideration of the bill that is now underway and will give careful uh, consideration to proposals for improvement to the bill and where child changes can be made to ensure the bank is better able to meet the ambitions set for it. We will work with partners across the Chamber and beyond to deliver those. Beside an officer with our natural and human resources and our political will, Scotland is very well placed to not only lead the way globally on carbon neutrality but to develop the industries and innovations that will help shape that future. We can do that to the best of our ability with the limited powers we have, but also recognise that to invest to the level required will need control of all the economic levers in Scotland that can only come with the full powers of independence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr McKee. Can I just ask members, please, to get the conversations down? Members are struggling to hear Mr McKee speak there. Can I call on Andy Whiteman to conclude this afternoon's debate? Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. And uh, thanks also to everyone who's spoken uh, in this debate. Um, I welcome the broadly constructive tone, uh, positive tone, I think, adopted by, yes, nearly all, nearly all members uh, in this debate. And despite differences in approach, uh, it's clear that I think the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, uh, the SNP and ourselves do share elements of this uh, ambition, even if we disagree perhaps on some matters to do with urgency uh, and emphasis. Uh, now, a Green New Deal is not, um, as the SNP amendment uh, claims, uh, just a policy uh, or a different set of interventions. It is a mission-driven, time-constrained and ambitious new economic paradigm. Uh, the mission is outlined in our motion, uh, the timescale is set out there too, and core elements of the means, uh, for example the objects of the Scottish National Investment Bank, are also set out. And although the Minister, uh, Mr McKee, uh, said he would listen carefully, uh, I didn't hear anything in response to Patrick Harvey's invitation that in fact we follow up the commitment made by the First Minister uh, at the STUC conference that if these ambitions uh, to incorporate uh, climate uh, in the Scottish National Investment Bank are so important they should be on the face uh, of uh, the bill. I will reflect shortly on contributions for members but first of all I thought I would highlight as already referred to by Richard Leonard a discussion that took place in the Economy Committee uh, yesterday when we convened a round table to discuss recent events relating to BIFAB, wider questions around the offshore supply chain and what the future uh, holds. Now clearly offshore and indeed onshore and all renewables play a key part uh, in, uh, and the core of any new Green Deal. But we have seen policy decisions made at a UK level historically that have meant we've missed much of the opportunity to become the world leader in offshore technology or wind technology or renewable technology in general. And so I recognise the disappointment uh, that is expressed in the STUC report that's referred to uh, in Labour's amendment relating to the opportunities we have missed historically to develop a stronger local economy uh, around offshore. But although we have missed those opportunities, the key is how we move forward. Now, Willie Rennie also outlined the broken promises that government has made uh, on re renewables. But yesterday we heard from the chair of BIFAB and the chair of DF Barnes about their alleged difficulties in securing a contract for the Concarden uh, and Murray East uh, wind farms, where a state-owned entity, the Spanish state-owned shipbuilder, undercut, uh, made a loss-making bid of 35% and raised questions, therefore, about state aid 
uh, rules. Now, the fact that other countries have, through state action on investment and procurement, supported the development of renewable technology and thus the economic benefits for workers and communities was highlighted as well. And so I think we need a much more joined up approach in procurement, in the supply chain, and a much more joined up approach between the Crown Estate, for example, who own the seabed and grant leases, Marine Scotland, who provide planning and licenses, and by the UK Department of Business, who provide contracts uh, for difference. So a Green New Deal means we need to learn from the mistakes of the past, but we need to move forward. Now, there's not been much discussion in this debate this afternoon about finance, but we have seen substantial billions of pounds made available in quantitative easing following the, the financial crash that didn't do anything to transform the economy and only enriched asset holders. We have pension funds around the world who are investing, big Canadian pension funds investing in shopping malls in Edinburgh. Uh, for the uh, consumption of the masses. We should be securing disinvestment in fossil fuels and greater investment by pension funds and the like, and sovereign wealth funds, and indeed crowdfunding, and indeed state-owned companies. Claudia Beamish, uh, Lewis MacDonald mentioned Sweden's Vattenfall, a wholly owned state company that is operating the European offshore wind deployment center. Now, the cabinet secretary talked about uh, joined up policy and she's right we welcome the just transition commission but it must be aligned as she alluded uh, hinted at to the infrastructure commission the energy strategy and most importantly Scotland's economic strategy now Maurice Golden talked about accused us indeed of extreme socialism <laughs> now I'm not really sure what that is but uh, it's got nothing to do with a green new deal and even 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 Richard Leonard uh, is not an advocate, I do not think, of extreme socialism. He told us this afternoon he, he, he wanted the whole economy, he wanted the whole economy to be a social economy. And, 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 and we would agree, we would agree with him. Now, to become a social economy, we do need to repurpose the economy. We do need to redesign it. It cannot be done uh, within the paradigm of neoliberal economics. So we agree. Uh, with Richard Leonard uh, on that. My colleague Mark Ruskell highlighted the potential of publicly owned energy companies and the Scottish National Investment Bank working uh, together. It's not widely known, it was revealed in committee yesterday that in fact the Scottish Government um, uh, uh, is a 28% stakeholder in BIFAB. It's also not widely known perhaps that the methyl yard in fact is in public ownership. It is owned by Scottish Enterprise. And, of course, none of this is unusual. I have just alluded uh, to countries like Sweden uh, and Vattenfall. Now, Lewis MacDonald and Ivan McKee claim that the Oil and Gas Technology Centre serves all sectors. I have the objects of the company here. Object number one, to be recognised as one of the top three centres globally for innovation and technology development, de development and deployment for the oil and gas industry. Object two, to be recognised worldwide as a leading oil and gas hub with particular focus on subsea production, mature base and asset management, maximising economic recovery and ensuring decommissioning excellence. No, I'm sorry, Mr Whiteman, I'm afraid there's no I, time I, for no interventions time. at this I, point. I, I am we sorry about that. <laughs> Presiding <laughs> officer, we are at an important moment in history. A number of members have talked about the imperatives of the climate crisis. But... but Rapid changes are unsettling, and that's why I agree with many members who say that a Green New Deal is imperative. We need to bring everyone with us. This is a deal, a contract, an understanding, and a commitment that we're all in this together to create a pathway to a clean, green, and peaceful future. The time has come for a Green New Deal for Scotland. I commend the motion to Parliament. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on a Green New Deal for Scotland. We'll move on to the next item of business which is consideration of business motion 17027 in the name of Graham Day. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, could I uh, call on Graham Day to move the business programme motion? Moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. And if no one uh, wishes to speak to this, the question is that motion 17027 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motions 17028 and 17029 on the stage one timetable for two bills and 17030 on the stage two timetable for a bill. Could I ask Graeme Day and perhaps the Bureau to move these three motions? Moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. And again, no one wishes to speak against the motions. Therefore, the question is that motions 170289 and 030 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, before we come to the decision time, I think we may have a point of order. Alexander Burnett, point of order. Point of order. Uh, presiding Officer, 
Uh, last week, the Chief Executive of the Parliament issued advice to all MSPs on the European elections. It made it quite clear that parliamentary resources should not be used for election campaigning. Now, in a statement earlier, Nicola Sturgeon said, and I quote, the Euro elections will also give voters a chance to back a party like the SNP. So... Order, please. So can... Order, please. Let the member finish, please. Uh, so can the presiding officer give us his guidance, given the First Minister used a parliamentary statement in her role as First Minister to make a party political statement explicitly appealing to voters in an upcoming election? Has Nicola Sturgeon kept to the spirit and letter of the advice given to MSPs? Can I... OK, thank you. Thank you, members. Thank you very much. Could I thank Mr Burnett for advance notice of his point of order? Uh, as the member noted in his comments, advice has been issued covering the European elections. It, it looks at, in particular at the operation of the members' expenses scheme and the wider use of parliamentary resources more generally. However, it does not cover the content of political comment in political proceedings in this chamber, such as statements, questions or debate. Now, having said, that, having said that, I will take advantage of this opportunity to remind all members to observe the distinction between political debate and blatant electioneering or campaigning and to refrain from the latter over the next few weeks. And on that note, can we turn to decision time? The first question this evening is that Amendment 17011.3 in the name of Jean Freeman which seeks to amend Motion 17011 in the name of Alison Johnson on addressing Scotland's GP recruitment and retention challenges be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17011.3 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes, 60, no, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 17011.2 in the name of Miles Briggs, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alison Johnson, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 17011.1 in the name of Monica Lennon, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alison Johnson be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 17011 in the name of Alison Johnson as amended on addressing Scotland's GP recruitment and retention challenges be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 17000.3 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham which seeks to amend motion 17000 in the name of Patrick Harvey on a Green New Deal for Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17000.3 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham is yes, 61, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 17000.1 in the name of Maurice Golden, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Patrick Harvey, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 17000.1 in the name of Maurice Golden is yes 29, no 92. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 17000.2 in the name of Richard Leonard, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Patrick Harvey, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17000.2 in the name of Richard Leonard is yes 31, no 90. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the final question is that motion 17000 in the name of Patrick Harvey as amended on a Green New Deal for Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17000 in the name of Patrick Harvey as amended is yes 92, no 28. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move to members' business shortly in the name of George Adam on MS Awareness Week 22nd to 29th April 2019. And we'll just take a few moments to allow members and the Minister to change seats. <laughs>